Good evening, Father. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> so you Good evening, are hosting. Good evening, sir. Father Sivan. Good evening. Not able to recognize. Uh, good evening, we are live. Uh, we can go to the chat. Okay. Good evening, dear fathers, sisters, and all those who are attending this Jesuit webinar from different parts of the world. A hearty welcome to all of you for the 25th Loyola Jesuit webinar series. Before we begin, let us spend a minute in silence and seek the blessings of God. Once again, I welcome you all for the Jesuit webinar series. Today, Father Francis P. Xavier, our resource person, is going to speak on understanding the Jesuits in today's context. I take this opportunity to introduce the resource person of today's webinar. Reverend Father Dr. Francis P. Xavier, SJ, is a member of the Jesuit Chennai province, India. At present, he is the Rector and Vice President of Loyola Institutions, Chennai. He is the Founder Director of Loyola Institute of Frontier Energy, that is LIFE, and Loyola ECAM College of Engineering and Technology, LISET, both at Loyola College, Chennai. He was the Gasson Professor at Boston College and the Vice President for Academic and Research, Jesuit Worldwide Learning, Geneva. He was the former provincial of the Jesuits in Tamil Nadu. We are very happy to have you, dear father, as a resource person of today's webinar on understanding Jesuits in today's context. Welcome, dear father. Father Francis P. Xavier will share with us who is a Jesuit, how they are different and unique from others, how did the Jesuit the Society of Jesus come to be, what are the characteristics, values, and significance of Jesuits, how the Jesuits are formed, and so on. So now may I welcome Father to share with us on Jesuits' understanding, understanding of Jesuits today. Over to you, Father. Thank you, Father William, for your nice introduction. Uh, my dear friends, Good evening to you all. Before I start, I want to acknowledge and thank Fathers Arul Sivan and Balan, both of them are tuition instructors, for going through my script when I wrote it some time ago for our officials. So I try to understand along with you the Jesuits, who we are, what we do, and where do we go. So a Jesuit, if you want to define, <clears throat> as the GC 32nd says, Jesuit is a sinner. Still, he is called to be a companion of Jesus. Just like Jesus, Jesuit also is a liberator, and his faith if it is to be alive, must be doing justice. And he's a reconciler, according to the latest general congregation, 
reconciling with God, with the fellow human beings and the creation. Above all, Jesuit is a contemplative in action. He is supposed to be a mystic in the marketplace. He lives and works for the glory of God in the service of the people. So he finds God in the people. Now, we may know this one just to, to recollect what are the various classifications of religious uh, congregation or orders. In the beginning, there was what is called the order, Benedictine order, Cistercians, Franciscans, Dominicans, Servites, Augustinians, Carmelites. The Jesuits is the last order, which was founded in 1540. Then there are the congregations. Again, papal congregation or diocesan congregation. Diocesan congregation is under the jurisdiction of the bishop. So under this category, you have the Redemptists, Salesians, Society of the Divine Word. In Tamil Nadu, you have Bonsakas, Franciscan Sisters of St. Joseph, Servites, St. Anne's Congregation in Trichy and Chennai, Congregation of Immaculate Conception, and so many other congregations are there. And the Brothers of the Sacred Heart is there. And the third category is the Secular Institute. They are not full-fledged religious. They are in the world, they are doing regular work, but they have certain regulations. For example, Opus Dei, the Schoenstatt Fathers, and later the lay associates, like Franciscan Third Order, Sodality, and the Vincent de Paul Society. All these things are various classification in the Catholic Church. And what are the classical religious tradition doing and what way Jesuits are different from them? The Jesuits are different breed. They don't have any specific mission right from the beginning. Their goal is to go where there is greater need, where the people is our, where the people need the Jesuits most. Also, the classical religious orders were in the cloisters. Normally, they'll be in the mountains, in the forests, or away from the city. They do prayers in groups. They have to sing the whole prayer in group. Each congregation has its own characteristic or specific habit or dress, and they are contemplatives. According to the Psalm 119, they will come together six times a day to sing the praise of God. Midnight, early morning, before lunch, afternoon, before supper, and before going to bed. So they will be praying. The Jesuits, Father Ignatius said, they need not come together so many times. It is enough if they concentrate on their work. So Jesuits are contemplatives in action. They're supposed to be conscious of what they are doing and they're supposed to find God in their work. That is the reason the Jesuit governance is decentralized, though it is monolithic. So the provincial will have a lot of powers and the local superiors would have its power. Everything is well defined. The, the purpose is that they would be doing the work in their own places. So coming to the historical development of the religious life, in the 50 AD, there was some groups spending their time in prayers and charity. Then around the third, fourth centuries, the Christian persecution started till Constantine, the emperor, embraced Christianity. Around the same time, some individuals in Egypt, they went to the desert, they were the solitary monks. They said and felt the world is very bad, they are, the world is sinful, they want to escape. They are called the desert fathers. One such example is an Antony the Hermit who lived in the third century. And the monasteries came, St. Benedict tried to bring all the individuals together in the sixth century. He started the monastic life. Then Bernard comes there, 
and mostly it will be away from the world. Still for them, the world is not a good place to live in. The world is bad or sinful, so they have to flee from it. So the cloister structure outside the cities, even today you have the remnants of that. Every religious house, you have what is called the cloister. In the men religious house, the women cannot go, and in the women religious house, men cannot go. So that is the remnant of what it was earlier where people were not allowed to go. And what, is, what did the monks do? They divided according to the Benedictine rule the day into three parts. Eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, eight hours rest. Then they also had a lot of time to experiment either in botany or otherwise, they also started educating. So normally they say the contribution of the religious cloisters are alcohol and education. Uh, even today, if you ask what is the best alcohol, they will say old monk, that is the trademark. But later there was move to transform the people. This is the beginning of the so-called mendicant orders in the 12th century. St. Dominic and Francis of Assisi started, and they wanted to be contemplatives in action. In this tradition only, Ignatius of Loyola started as contemplatives in action. For him, education is the essential and fundamental thing to be given to the people. And this is also a way where you can organize the youth, formal education. Then the Salatians came, they concentrated on the orphans and semi-orphan or street children through skill training for them. When the Jesuits were giving formal education, Salatians started skill training there. Then in the 20th century, Pius XII wanted the secular institutes, those who cannot be full-time religious, but still they would like to follow a religious fraternity. So Franciscan Third Order, Sodality started by the Jesuits, Vincent de Paul, Colping Society, and so many other things came into uh, existence. The time of Ignatius and the time of Luther, they are overlapping. When Luther was having a lot of uh, things against the church, the Reformation was going on, the challenge was highly intellectual. But Ignatius found the people were illiterate. So how do you defend the church? So what is needed is critical thinking. Each one should think for oneself and each one should have a personal enlightenment. Ignatius had only a handful of his companions and they are not able to formidably put up a fighting front against Luther, though said, let us educate the people. So the education is supposed to give the people critical thinking and they should be able to think for themselves, decide for themselves, see for themselves what is right or wrong. So the Society Jesuit Order was founded in 1540. It took seven or eight years for them to come to an understanding that they need to found educational institutions. Ignatius and six of his first companions, all of them had master's degree from the University of Paris, but their instantaneous thinking was not education, helping people in the hospital or in the prison or preaching, so many other things. But in after eight years, 1548, they started the school in Messina in Sicily and the Roman college, which is Today, Gregorian University was started in 1551. When education was very costly, only the feudal lords could afford to get educated. Ignatius put up a board, education will be given free. <clears throat> then when Francis Xavier came to Goa, he started a Paul's College, 1543. And at that time it was meant to be a seminary to train the seminarians. Even today, the entrance arch is still there in Goa. So within a decade after founding of the Jesuit order, 30 colleges and universities came up in Europe. And by late 18th century, there were 800 secondary and higher education institutions in all the five countries. 
In India, the first university college, perhaps the first in India, is St. Joseph's College, founded in 1844, founded in Nagapatnam after 40 years shifted to Trichy. And today in India, the Jesuits are owning or running more than 50 arts and science colleges, 12 business schools, 15 colleges of education, three engineering colleges, and two universities. Zewar University in Bhuvaneswar and Zewar University, Kolkata. And Karnataka province is trying to bring in university and the Chennai province and Madurai province also are trying to bring in universities. In USA, you have 28 universities and you see 14 of the universities have non-Jesuits as presidents because this is the time where the Jesuits want uh -huh. to work with the partners uh -huh. in a mission. Yeah. So today there are about 3,000 Jesuits uh, in 200 uh, Jesuit okay. institutions of higher learning in 110 countries. And this is the statistics according to the 34th General Congregation. And what is very important, what is very binding is the constitutions of the Jesuits. Ever since it was written that no correction was made. Last time they felt there could be a correction in the 36th General Congregation regarding the resignation of Father General out of respect for the constitution, they said we shall put it in the footnote. So such is very sacred, the constitution. It is studied as textbook in even in the Indian Institute of Management. This follows the Pareto's 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule means if you look at the world, 20% of the people would be owning 80% of the property. And if you take in any institution, about 20% of the people will bring in 80% of the work. And you take any classroom, 20% of the students will be getting more than 80% of the mark. So coming to the constitution, 80% of the constitution talks about formation and 20% only is an administration. Because Ignatius would like with 20% costs, you should be able to reap 80% of the consequence. In other words, with 20% of the input, you should be able to get 80% of the output. So this is based on, on the one hand, critical thinking, on the other hand, religious obedience. How you bridge these two, that is the beauty that the constitution is telling us. And it is in this secret, finding God in everything and seeking everything in God. In other words, to see everything and new in God. This was Ignatius' experience at River Cardona. This year we are celebrating the 500th year of Ignatius' enlightenment and we are living out his uh, experience in God and seeing everything. And as I mentioned earlier, Jesuit order started with no specific work. Their goal was greater need of the people. So initially they said, our goal is care of the soul. So they started spiritual preaching, care of the sick, etc. Then they said, well, if you make the people intellectually strong, then they are on their own. So they started founding schools and colleges. Then they realized, well, human being is a social being. So you should work on the society. And there are so many people who can't afford to get education. So many people are suppressed and we should go for affirmative action. And still today, we are going in that line. Later they found they also need political uplift. They should fight for the human rights. This is in the 16th century when the colonial powers are uh, occupying South America where the slave trade was uh, practically accepted. The Jesuits said slaves are also human beings. To prove that they also started the so-called Jesuit reductions or Jesuit republics in 31 uh, colonies they had in Peru, Chile, Argentina, et cetera. And they also bought slaves but they left the, let them free. They were working on cooperative basis. Later they said, well, what is uh, needed is economical structure. 
Then we started the liberation theology of the oppressed and discriminated. And from there only comes preferential option for the poor and the Dalits, or in the US it is for the Hispanics and the other people who are oppressed. Ultimately, all this evolution of Jesuit mission is empowerment. That is preferential option for the people at the margins. With that, the Jesuits feel that is their ultimate goal. And also later in our own days, you can see as in the picture of Father Stan, Swami and others, human rights. Not only they freed the slaves, not only the Afro-Americans were uh, given more fight or freedom, not only Hispanics or tribals and the Dalits, wherever there is suppression, discrimination, Jesuits will be there. And the general congregation also says the Jesuits faith should do justice. So it is not mere pastoral work of the faith, it is social action of the justice. So you both have to go together. You, can, you might have heard about some of the Jesuits, the Barrigan in the United States, he spent most of his time in prison because he was fighting for social action. And Michael Pro in Mexico, he was shot dead. And in our own days, you know, Father Stan saw me. And the empowering key is the education, but social transformation. The education that the Jesuits give to the individual is not the property of the individual. It is the common property of the society. So the individual has to work for the society. That is why the education is for the people. So the education is for the enlightenment. It may serve as employment source, but ultimately empowerment with rights. Here we can recall the parallel from Dr. Ambedkar, education, organization, agitation for their rights. And the Jesuits by and large, they are in the intellectual ministry. Initially, it was education as one of the ministries. But as Polanco, the secretary of uh, uh, Ignatius would write, later education became the key ministry. Education need not necessarily mean academic education, political education, social action education, pastoral education, human rights education. But the focus was initially higher education and research. The methodology was Ignatian pedagogical paradigm. It is called integrated pedagogical paradigm. The formula is given here, both in the uh, slide or in the things. In a given context, based on your experience, you reflect what is to be done, what needs to be done, what you are capable of doing, how you can network with others, then draw up an action plan, then start off. But every now and then evaluate. What did I want to do? What I'm doing? Do I need course correction? So that enriches my experience. Then I go back the same cycle of reflection, action, evaluation. So the context is very important. And when it comes to the research, as Pope uh, Francis said, we got to find out the root causes of poverty and migration, and also viable solution for this. This is one of the Jesuit focus, that's why the Jesuits always prefer uh, uh, this uh, liberal arts uh, and science. And the Jesuit formation is, we are coming to the next two phase. How do the Jesuits uh, get their formation? The formation is mainly for decision-making and for action. The formation is at three levels, head level, heart level, hand level. The head, you should be able to do critical thinking. You should be able to think out of box. At the same time, you should be uh, tuned with the heart. The heart should be large enough, whole heart to embrace the least, the lost and the last in the society. When the head and the heart are balanced, then the hand is empowered to launch into action. So the hand is strengthened to fight for justice because your head and heart are there. So your hand is welcoming hand of the needy. At the same time, you have to be effective and effective 
in mission. So this is the basis of the Jesuit formation. And the focus of the formation is, though we take long years, I'll come to that. The Jesuits, as Chris Loney would say, are men of twice 30 day spiritual exercise people. In the lifetime, when we begin the formation, and when we also end the formation, both will have a gap of uh, about 20 years. You spend 30 days in silence, uh, meditating or reflecting on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And Ignatius would say, you need not worry about six times coming together to pray. You may not have time, but what is important is at least twice a day, pause, examine how conscious you have been. We call it examination of conscience or examination of consciousness. And this examination is mainly where I should be, where I am. Do I need course correction? This is what the, P, the Jesuits would do once a year, they take eight days off. We call it annual retreat to review and then to preview and to plan for what it is. So the continuous course correction for the better is in personal life, in your ministry. This also helps one to grow in the inner freedom with indifference. We are grateful to our people who are working and we have detachment, but at the same time, we try to narrow down the gap between the ideal and real. The trick is how do you narrow down the gap between the ideal and the real? Jesuits live in apostolic religious community. Each one will be doing the work assigned to him, but they build a teamwork where there is communication and they get the direction from the leader, whether it's a local superior or the provincial superior or the superior general. All these are based on that Jesus is the master and Lord. And we are animated by the vision of the founders and Ignatius of Loyola. We are driven by the spiritual exercises with discernment as way of life. And we also help others seek God in everything. It is not enough that I seek God, I help others also. That's why Ignatius would say, your salvation is in the salvation of your fellow human beings. We read in the Bible that God created us in his image and likeness. So we carry a little bit of the semblance of God. Only when we come together, the full God will be alive. So either we reach God together or we miss God altogether. Now coming to the stages of formation, you may be familiar with that. I try to go a little faster. I would put it in five stages. And the duration is 14 to 16 years. Why so long? Ignatius wanted to have solid formation. He wanted each Jesuit should have thinking head, loving heart and transforming hand. The first to face is the novitiate. We have pre-novitiate also to have a preview of religious life. In the novitiate, you make 30 days silent retreat. There are some experiments where you go and work with the people. Then the first two hours, it is perpetual vows. It is for life you take it. In all other congregation, it is temporary vows. Every three years you have to renew. And the junior aid is followed by junior aid, one year. This is the foundation of intellectual studies. So you take about four years for this. The next stage is intellectual studies, normally university studies, as well as philosophical studies. We have to do secular as well as religious because in India, for example, philosophy and theology are not recognized. Uh, there are a couple of universities where you go find philosophy, but there is no university which has a theology degree. So UG three years, uh, philosophy two years, PG two years, so another seven years gone. Then the Regency is another area where about 10 years you have a break. You are given enormous responsibility and you are given administrative power and you see whether it is worth continuing in this religious life. And the Jesuit order also sees whether you are a liability or you are an asset. So this is the integration of formation with ministries. 
and the decision is taken on both sides after two years. Then you go to the theology, and there you try to see everything anew in God. There you learn in uh, the, you have classes, ethics, church history, systematic, social, pastoral, biblical. And once you are ordained, then still you are not thrown out into the mission. You are supervised in your pastoral ministry. This is called subam, supervised pastoral ministry. At least one year already as a deacon, you are going and spending uh, with, not with a Jesuit uh, parish priest, with the diocesan clergy, so that you know how they are doing the work, how you are able to think and identify with the church. So here you are having the supervised pastoral ministry. Then afterwards, you might be sent for higher studies, uh, specialization studies. It may be three years, four years, five years, even six years, if you are going for doctoral studies and all. Then about five or six years after your ordination comes the last phase that is called the tertiary. It is called the affective phase. It is called the school of heart or school of love. All along this 14, 15, even 20 years, you have been intellectually formed. Perhaps you have become a head person, but you should become a heart person. So that is, you come together in the tertianship, and this is called the third year of novitia, the tertiary tertianship. Again, you make this 30 day retreat, which you did in the novitia. Again, you have experiments, but what is additional is you spend time studying the constitution of the Jesuits. They also, after their one month retreat, study the spiritual exercises. They also go about giving retreats. This will be about six to 12 months. Then you take the final vows. Then you become a full-fledged member of the Jesuit order. Then the provincial missions you. And the mission is to go where there is greater need. This is the constitution 622. You are sent. The provincial is supposed to meet individual Jesuit personally in the place where the Jesuit is working. Sometimes it is far away places. And the provincial should understand the person, his health, his mindset, his uh, ability to do, either to confirm in the work he is doing or to give a shift of uh, mission or to get some help for him to do better. So the cura personalis, we call it, is very important at this point of time. Now, what are the characteristics of the Jesuits? In the administration, you have the discernment. The discernment is for the greater good, not what I like, not what I dislike. There should be this, the indifference, which means no judgmental attitude, no prejudice. And we follow in decision-making two level decisions. One is making the decision, another is taking the decision. When the superior, either local superior, or provincial superior, consults the people, the community members or province people, about the pros and cons, that is called the making the decisions. After listening to all prayerfully and reflecting on that, the superior or the provincial takes the decision. Once the decision is taken, it becomes everybody's decision. That is the confidence we have in the local superior or the provincial. But the mission is given to the community. There may be a principal who is in charge of a college. There may be a director of another school, but the mission is not given to that individual, but it is given to the community. So it is the community and the individual principal or secretary or director, they are doing the work in the name of the Jesuit community. And all the Jesuits should be available out of love. They should be available for the mission. The goal is collective, but individual does the work, whatever is assigned to do that. This also is done with freedom and responsibility. You have playroom. You can do, you can be innovative in the work you have, 
uh, you are able to do the things, but keep the superior informed. And the entire Jesuit order did an exercise of 18 months in 85 plus provinces they were discussing. Then they came up with universal apostolic preferences or planning for the next 10 years, 2019 to 2029. So they came up with that. Based on that, each province, province apostolic preferences, they came up with their plan. Based on the province, each community apostolic planning came. Based on the community, each individual apostolic planning came. So it is like the, uh, the Russian doll. One should be sitting into the other, but there is a broader global picture local picture, personal picture, but ultimately all would be having the oneness of heart and mind. Ultimately, what happens is the heroic leadership. This is a summary of the book by Chris Loney, The Heroic uh, uh, Leadership. There are four qualities he evolves. He was a former Jesuit. The first one is self-awareness. The leader should be aware of <clears throat> his strength and weakness, his light and shadow. Only then he would be able to understand others' strength and weakness. The second one is ingenuity. The whole world becomes the mission field for him. Be genuine, no acting here. Then once that is done, put your heart and soul into that. Have passion, love for the work. Don't be afraid of that because you are the backup system of the community or your superiors. Then finally, you should be a person of heroism, men of marches, to do ever better and to do ever more. So Ignatius is often shown with one leg raised and ready to move. A Jesuit also should be ready with one leg raised to move on. This is called the apostolic aggressiveness. And the Jesuit has the audacity of hope. The leader is supposed to see the invisible and is supposed to make it possible what is impossible. That spirit is derived from Ignatius. And what is the local administration? In the local administration, there is the rector, superiors and team leaders are there. And each one is uh, helped by the consult. About four members will be there. And the superior is not bound by consults because consult members are consultants. Again, this is different from other congregations. In other congregations, the superior may not be overruled the consult members. But in the Jesuit order, as I said, monolithic, the, the uh, local superior can think after consulting the people, the provincial also can do that. Ultimately, what is supposed to be is care of the people, care of the work. You be effective with the people and be efficient with your work. And the leader is supposed to be giving animation and direction. And the local superior reports to the provincial and provincial reports to the general. Coming to the province administration, as I mentioned earlier, the provincial's main job is visitation and meeting each one where there is manifestation of conscience. Again, another characteristic of the Jesuits, the provincial can demand of the individual anything. We call it forum internum, forum externum. In other religious congregation, what is external, you could question. You are not keeping the account all right, or you are very strict in administration. But what is personal, you cannot ask. But in the Jesuit order, provincial can ask anything. What is secret, what is anything. That's called the manifestation of conscience. And at the same time, the provincial has the main mission, cura personalis. He affirms the individual. He extends all support. Whenever needed, he changes the mission or he brings in extra help for the individual. The individual should be healthy and happy. That is the responsibility of the provincial. And the cura apostolica is the work has to be done. There should be proper planning and there should be monitoring 
and constant direction should be given. So the provincial has to place the right person in the right place at the right time. He's helped by socios, we call the companion and the consult to members. And there are various commissions. We have about 12 commissions uh, in the province and each commission is having a coordinator and each commission, the members will be Jesuits, eight members, six will be Jesuits, two will be our co-workers so that we work together with them and provincial reports to the general. And above the provincials, there is another structure that comes the conference. The entire society is divided into six conferences. In South Asia is our conference, which, uh, which has India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal. And the person is called the POSA, Provincial of South Asia, or we call it conference head. So you also, the other conferences are um, uh, East Asia, Europe, Africa, North America, South America. And uh, the POSA is coordinating the provinces. The provincials meet once in six months. One such meeting you see in the photo, they study the status of what we are doing and they think about the common houses, philosophy and theology are done together, tertianships or Indian social institutes in Bengaluru and Delhi and Sadhana, all these things are coming under the provincial of South Asia. He reports to Father General. So today, the Jesuits are in 110 countries. According to January 2021 statistics, we are 14,839. In India, there are 4,000 uh, Jesuits. You see about more than 25% of the Jesuits are in India. And the Chennai province, the youngest province in the society, we are 172 members today. And now coming to the final one, the general Scuria. The general is known as <clears throat> Black Pope. The Pope puts on the white dress. The clerical is supposed to see the black dress, but the general of the Jesuits are very powerful. So it's called the Black Pope. He's elected for life. The Catholic Church, two people are elected for life the Pope and the Jesuit general. All of the religious congregations, you elect the general for six years, you could elect him or her for another six years, then the person has to go. The resignation is possible. Now, according to the canon law, the last general congregation, it was decided there could be possibility for the general to resign, but there is a big process and he has to consult all the provincials, get the concurrence, and he has got to four assistants called Ad Providentium who takes care of him. And there are general counselors, 12, and general has to consult all these people if ever he decides to resign. It should be for a grave reason. In addition, there are secretaries, secretary for higher education, secretary for uh, secondary education, secretary for social action, all those things, there is treasurer general and postulator general, procurator general, all these things, we call it the curia. There are about 10 secretariats for education, social action and refugees and all those things. What is very interesting is effective communication and direction. Many governments study the Jesuit administration for their own governments. What Ignatius has done is very effective, communicative, and a lot of directions, and they study what we are doing. And what is the change we are going through? Earlier, the picture today, you see this is the picture in Lisset in Engineering College. You could see there are only two Jesuits standing there. I am there only as a rector. The director is the only Jesuit who is there. We have one financial controller is part-time working there. All others non-Jesuits. The principal is an non-Jesuit. Earlier, all Jesuits were in administration. Now we are sharing the power with non-Jesuits. 
In Loyola Arts and Science College, for example, we have made it clear to ourselves, even if Jesuits are there, the deputy principal would be a non-Jesuit. The deputy principal would be practically the effective principal for shift to two. And so we are sharing the power because they are the partners in mission. And now we are more and more incorporating them into our training program. In the future, Jesuits have to be prepared to work under the partners. Like in Loyola campus, the principal of engineering college and the principal of uh, college of education are non-Jesuits. If Jesuits have to work, they have to follow that direction. Or take, for example, US, out of 28 universities, 14 universities have non-Jesuits as presidents. Jesuits have to follow their direction. What is important is you should be able to share the vision and responsibility with our co-workers. And what is important, as I said, is the review and policy making. That is the characteristic of any corporate management. And we come together with the called province congregation once in four years. This is again something unique for the Jesuits. In all other religious congregations, they ought to come together once in six years to elect the general or to elect the second term. But Ignatius said, you need not come. Elect the general for life, let the provincials take care of it. But then the Pope said to make a compromise, once in four years, there will be province congregation. We are going to have it uh, next May. Then we elect one person and they will go. Then that's called the procurator's congregation. The next procurator congregation will be in May 2023. Before that, each province will elect a person and they go. And their main thing is they study the status of the society. And they also study whether any major things have to be done, whether we should call for the general congregation. They spend a week or so to do that. And normally when the general dies or when he resigns, then the general congregation is called for. The provincials are ex officio, depending on the number of the province, uh, one, two or three uh, delegates will go there. And again, they study the situation in the society, the needs, and they elect the new general. Uh, in this way, only the present general father Arturo Sosa is the 31st general elected by the 36th general congregation. As you could see, in 1540 to 2016 is the 31st general, con general. And what is the general congregation doing? Policy making. This is the highest uh, body that makes the decisions. And what is the outcome in the 32nd general congregation? the preferential option for the poor came. They gave the directives to the entire society. And the 36th general congregation, they gave the triple reconciliation with God, with fellow and with the nature. And also they recommended the roadmap, what you call the universal apostolic planning for the next 10 years. And the universal apostolic planning are four, then spiritual exercises should be our way of life. That is discernment, should be the governing or dynamic principle in our life. Second, marching with the marginalized. What was the preferential option for the poor is reinterpreted as faith that does justice. The third one is accompanying the youth. Here only the education plays a major role. Today, the youth are directionless and they don't have hope. We have to kindle hope in them. And the fourth is, care of our common home. Pope Francis is very much into it, ecology and environment. Based on this, the province, both Madurai and Chennai province has come up and the only uh, significant difference is the marching with the marginalized, we have clarified ourselves, empowering the Dalits and the tribals. So this will be our policy. So what is our mantra? What is the values? <clears throat> this is the marches. You face the challenge in order to strive for excellence. 
the students or people we are working with should become men and women for others and with others, centered around justice, equality, and dignity. The Kura personalis is needed not only for the superiors, for each Jesuit, for people whom we serve, because each one is unique and each one is a potential leader. And each one should be able to integrate heart, mind, and head. This is our formation is for transformation of the society. This is what we call it ad maiorum dei gloriam, that is the glory of God is the human being fully alive. And the key is the education. We form men and women as agents of social change. It is not a degree, it's not a diploma. It is not going abroad, it is not getting salary. How much you are forming, reforming or transforming the society. In this, we follow the principle of tantum quantum as Ignatius has put in the spiritual exercises under principle and foundation that you have to use what is helpful, you have to avoid what is not helpful. So this is the guiding principle of the Jesuits. Now I go to, based on these, some of the Jesuits, there are hundreds of them, I just pinpoint uh, a few. Uh, Christopher Clavios is the one who designed the Gregorian calendar. Earlier we had 10 months in the year and Julius Caesar introduced to July, Augustus Caesar introduced to August, so it came to 12 years and Clavius formulated the calendar that we are using it today. And Matteo Ricci, he brought maths and astronomy to China. The uh, lab or the astronomy uh, area, what he did is still there. And Constantine Besky, as you know, he mastered Tamil and he wrote the Tamil epic Tambavani. And Henry Hendricus, another missionary, he printed the first book in Tamil. It was printed in uh, Portugal, but it's the first book printed in Tamil. Taya de Chagan that you see in the picture, he's the one who found the so-called missing link in Pijing. And in the evolution theory, when if people evolved from monkeys, monkeys were going on four legs. When human beings started moving up in two legs, the, the backbone, there is some change. And to prove that, he found out that. He's the one also who brought out the concept of omega point. Christ is the omega point. He predicted that physical evolution is getting over. Now we are in the intellectual evolution then it will become spiritual evolution that called the noosphere. And there we will be meeting God, man, that is called the Omega point. And in our own country, you know, Jerome de Souza, who was the principal of Loyola College, he was the member of the Constituent Assembly. He represented India in the UN four times. And Gerard Manley Hopkins is an English poet. And Carl Rauner is the number one theologian He's the one who coined the word anonymous Christians. There are some people who may not be Christians, but they live out the Christian values. Will they get salvation? Definitely they will. This was also accepted by Dalai Lama. And of course, Pope Francis, who is for nature and for the poor. And John Sobrino in South America, who is the author of liberation theology. And you know, the. The malaria, the medicine was discovered by the Jesuits. You call it quina. It is uh, discovered by two Jesuits, Pelletier and Cavento. And Acosta is the one who discovered the altitude sickness. Some people, when they go high in the plane, they feel giddy. So they said there is, it's a sickness. And Poscovich is the one who discovered the atomic theory. He's the father of the atomic theory. And also this uh, Poscovich and his companion Christopher measured the earth, not physically, but theoretically, which, which happened to be correct. And he's the one they said, the earth is not spherical, but oblate spheroid, like the orange where you press from the top and because of the earth is rotating, the central part is bulging out. And this proved Newton's principle. And Robert Pusa is the latest one. 
today, you know, in our computer, you are seeing all the texts that I am showing here, or you type your text. The hypertext was introduced in the IBM computer by the Jesuit Posa. He went to the IBM owner and he worked for 10 years with him and he introduced that. So with this, I would like to conclude with this. So here are a few reading materials for you if you are interested in reading. With that, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for your um, patient listening. If you have anything to ask, I will try to clarify if I can. Thank you for your director for your insightful and informative talk on understanding Jesuits in today's context. It is very contextual and need of the hour. Dear participants, now you are most welcome to post your questions in the chat box or you are most welcome to have interaction with the speaker. I, I have a question to ask Father Xavier. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. I'm Father Blaise D'Souza from Bombay. I want to know whether we have tried to reinterpret the first UAP in a multi-religious context, like in India. How would we communicate this to, say, non-Christians? Or how would we carry out in our multi-religious type of educational institution, whether there are people of different faiths? It's a good question, Father. And uh, I think at least uh, in our corner of the world, we are trying to do. <clears throat> you mean the discernment, uh, the spiritual exercises as way of life, right? Yes, and the uh, discovery of God, I would put it like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Specifying in terms of Jesus Christ and the spiritual exercises. Sure. Are dealing with our, say, student body that is very mixed. You know. Right. How would we put it across? To so here in Loyola College, Chennai, we have the Institute of uh, Religions and Culture, Institute of Dialogue with Religions and Culture. It's a research institute. We not only we bring other religious people, we dialogue and we learn to learn what they have and what we can offer. The discernment process. The discernment is not that the conversion that we try to convert or we getting converted, try to understand, become conscious of others. And in the student body, we take all these principles. For example, the discernment is the decision making for our faculty members. We are uh, giving uh, uh, courses and the things, how to make a decision, how to make the, what is called the making the decision and taking the decisions. We are constantly doing that. Uh, the, in our uh, uh, the school of uh, business, they are also working at that. So we, in our context, we are doing the same thing. I think in all our uh, pastoral or even social action centers, and our provincial constantly says, whatever you do, bring in the co-workers or the partners in mission. So very often our youngsters, like they are working for the, um, the uh, tribals or the fisher folk, they sit and discuss and discern and do the work. It is not the Jesuits tell them, you do this, they do it. What shall we do? This is the present context. This is our experience. How would we do that? So we are taking it in the secular uh, language or in their cultural language or in their values. But I agree with you, we still need to spread our wings and go to newer heights. Yeah, uh, just to respond a little, 
I think uh, we need to help them to discover very common universal values that are there in the core of most religions as such. Sure. So even in whatever religion they have, that there are core values which perhaps in dialogue with them we need to discover and perhaps learn something ourselves also, which would be enriching for us. Like, for example, I have learned a lot about the concept of harmony from tribals, <laughs> for whom harmony matters, the harmony among themselves and harmony with the environment matters very much. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Father. Uh, Father, there's another question. Uh, I don't know the name. They asked the etymology of the word, just which. It's very interesting. You can give uh, two different uh, definitions or explanation. If you go to the Oxford Dictionary and you look at Jesuitical, it is interpreted cunning. Yeah, Jesuit, uh, I don't know whether they were cunning, they could have been. But the meaning is uh, Jesuitical. But the Jesuit is coming from followers of Je Jesus. The Jesuit order is coming more from there. You are a companion of Jesus, so Jesuit. Uh, uh, philology, I am not very sure about that. This is the explanation. I think if anybody else could uh, come to help, I will be happy. From the same person, there is another question, Father. Is, an, is there an anomaly in stating that anonymous Christian also get the salvation? I think most of us agree that they also are eligible for salvation. You remember recently there was a moving scene um, where uh, I think Pope Francis was meeting the youngsters and one little boy was crying and uh, he called uh, him and said, what is bothering you? He said, my father never believed in God. Will he also go to heaven? But he was very nice. He was very good to us. I am little worried about that. And the response of uh, Pope Francis was, anybody who is good, God would be merciful to him. So I think that anonymous Christians, uh, this is one of my uh, uh, thought tomorrow I am sharing with the ICOF people. It is not the Christian dogmas that ICOF is standing for, it's Christian values that we are taking for. I am giving a couple of examples also. It's the Christian values, as Father Blaise said, there are common values. So that is also universal values. You take whatever is good from others. I'm not uh, talking about salad religion, but the conviction that we are for others. So I, I personally believe that uh, if you are good, you are good and God will take care of you. Second, whether going to heaven or hell, it is between you and God. Who am I to judge? How do I know what happens in the last minute? So that is not my cup of tea. It is God created me. God will take care of me. So that is my view. Thank you, Father. Uh, there is a question from Father Simon Dimalo. What is the distinguishing mark of a Jesuit? How Jesuit is different from Salatian? He also has said this may help in vocation promotion. Okay, somebody asked... Uh, how should a diplomat be? Someone said a diplomat should be able to talk for hours without telling the truth. So I am not comparing Jesuits with that. Both the Jesuits are Salatians for that matter, any religious congregation. They are there to bring in the kingdom of God. Various aspects. As I mentioned in the talk, the Jesuits are more on the formal education or higher education, let us say, more. They are also in other areas. 
students more or at least in the beginning skill based education they what they had the oratory what they have through games and the things they will be doing that so each one is like a um, uh, complementary uh, ministry in the vineyard of the lord some may be working in uh, in uh, preaching for example the um, uh, the redemptorists they are supposed to be specialists in preaching or svds they are supposed to be specialists in the bible biblical theology or the servites they are supposed to be specialists in mariology and all are put together is what we call the kingdom of god so we each one is having specific but also we work other parts so vocation promotion is i believe that god invites all of us when you take the first step god takes hold of your hand and leads the rest and very often we join a congregation which is familiar to me uh sometimes i met once uh, a parish priest uh, in california he said all along i studied in uh, jesuit school and college in jesuit university i wanted to become a jesuit my mother took me to the parish priest and the parish priest said why do you want to spend 14 years join the seminary you will become a priest in 7 years my mother said go to the seminary so you call it uh, will of god or you call it accident it depends how you do that one so to summarize all religious congregation have their charism but they are doing the same work of god in different perspectives we complement each other thank you father there is uh, another question from arun it's heartening and of deep consolation to listen to you on jesuit his identity his formation the structure of the society the other congregations and the corporates are borrowing heavily the great insights of jesuit formation how come we are lacking the standard of the society and miss the ideals of ignatius despite a long formation it depends how you look at it <clears throat> Uh, as i said there is always a gap between the ideal and the real if ignatius is the ideal person i tend to imitate him i tend to live out i might become 60% uh, as uh, jesus said uh, i may bring forth 30% of ignatius 60% of ignatius 90% of ignatius may not be 100% of ignatius otherwise you will uh, i may replace ignatius so we work slowly we are going into that we are all human beings this uh, i always say let us find perfection in imperfection god finds perfection in the imperfection god could write as uh, i think ignatius said as somebody said god could write straight in the crooked line so that is the way we have it's a learning process there is never ending our formation is never ending just because you have done 16 years of formation doesn't mean you are fully formed you are fully incorporated in the society if i remember in the final vows you say i am fully incorporated we don't say i am fully formed formation is an ongoing process so we are in the learning process as ignatius felt uh, the 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 god is a uh, my teacher i learn always thank you father there is a question from sister alosia from sjl congregation what is the hallmark of the jesuits in this covid situation i think sister itself was a hallmark along with you during the pandemic situation availability and ready to meet with the challenges now i am very grateful to you uh, from the jesuit migrant mission and sister alosia and others sister valarmedi and all those things the availability and meeting the challenge i think we have done a, a good job at that 
So the hallmark of the Jesuit, that's why Ignatius says, be ready to go where you are sent, where there is greater need. He writes even unto the Indies. At the, in the 1540s, nobody knew where India was. They did not know what Indies mean, whether it is India, China, Sri Lanka, so unknown place. So any challenge, any time, the hallmark of the Jesuit is be ready to meet with the challenge and uh, do your best. Thank you, Father. I think no, no more questions on the floor. Okay, Father Arul is putting up his hand. Uh, this is not my question, Father Francis. It's a kind of appreciation for you. A hearty congratulation. I suggest sweet. Your talk is an eye-opener for me. Uh, you are given enough details in the history and information about the site of Jesus. I feel very proud of you. Just a brief session for you. Thank you, Father Thank Arun. You. Yeah. I think I like the word eye-opener. I think you can remove your speech. Father, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall we wind up? Okay, sure. So once again, thank you, dear Father Rector, for your insightful and informative talk on understanding Jesuits in today's context. It is very much contextual and need of the hour. I also would like to thank Father Justin Prabhu and Jesuit Scholastics at Loyola for organizing this webinar. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Father Ilango Xavier, Associates to the Provincial, for sending the invite to various people. Thank you, Mr. Samson, for your technical support. Thank you to your participants for your active participation and interaction. Once again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a pleasant evening. I would like to thank all of you for your uh, participation. Especially, I want to thank Father Justin, our minister for overall arrangements, and uh, Scholastics Zenith, who is uh, the manager and here uh, Scholastic Thomas is here for any emergency, he will take care of me. And uh, William for the first time, nice to see William uh, being the moderator. And also all of you uh, for participating in this one. Have a nice evening, wish you all the best. We learn more from Ignatius and live out more the spirit of Ignatius. Have a nice evening, thank you. <laughs>